Today we have with us uh, Dr. Sean Gallagher. Uh, he has close to 40 years of experience in the field of ergonomics and is a certified professional ergonomist. Um, he is a two-time winner of the International Ergonomics Association, also known as the Liberty Mutual Medal in Occupational Safety and Ergonomics uh, in 2013 and uh, 2018. He's also a recipient of the 2020 Paper of the Year Award by the, jur uh, by the journal Ergonomics. At present, he is the Hal N. and Peggy S. Bennington Associate Pref uh, Professor Emeritus in Auburn University's Department of Industrial Engineering. Uh, fun fact about him, he's a classically trained musician and owns uh, several guitars. Uh, I also have with me the producer of our show, uh, Aditi Bhatt. My name is uh, Vivek Narayan. Dr. Gallagher, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Dr. Gallagher, um, we usually start off by uh, asking our guests, uh, you know, what interests them in the field that they're uh, uh, occupied in, um, how they got there. Um, you know, when it comes to uh, biomechanics and ergonomics, how did you how did you get involved in this area of research? Well, as you've kind of alluded to, I had quite a roundabout path uh, that I took uh, to get into the field of ergonomics. I started off as a music major and I studied a classical guitar at uh, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, but during that time, I was also a soccer player. Uh, so we might have to get a soccer game going as well. <laughs> um, and I became interested in, in exercise physiology and work physiology, you know, because of that, that interest. And I eventually got a master's in in physical education at uh, Penn State University. And after I got my master's, I, I um, came on with a, a government job where I worked for the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. And I found with the research that I was doing that I needed to get more, more uh, biomechanics training. And I went to the Ohio State University in order to get that training under under Dr. Bill Maris. And uh, my dissertation at, uh, at OSU involved a repeated stressing of spinal motion segments, which uh, eventually led me to my fatigue failure model of musculoskeletal disorders. And so now I'm at Auburn University. I've been here for the, about the past 12 years or so and I'm continuing to do biomechanics and ergonomics related research. Awesome. Um, you mentioned uh, the work, so the fatigue failure model. For, for our guests, could you just be, briefly describe um, what that is? Uh, and, you know, uh, there's, I, I think there's sort of two viewers that we have. We sort of have the professionals, but there's also, I would call them um, uh, highly uh, interested, uh, but non-professional. So, you know, um, just catering to both those audiences, if you do, wouldn't mind just describing what that, what that is. Sure. Uh, well, fatigue failure has been known for a long time as a process by which uh, metals and plastics and all sorts of materials will fail if they are repeatedly stressed. And so this will happen with steel, you know, bridges will, you know, eventually fail a lot of times because they'll get repeatedly stressed and small cracks will start to appear. And with continued loading, those cracks kind of continue to increase in size. And so, you know, it's been really shown that, you know, all kinds of materials uh, do experience fatigue failure. There's not one that's known that, that doesn't. And our, our, our theory is basically that musculoskeletal tissues are also materials and that they get repeatedly stressed. I mean, that's something that we, we always talked about in, in ergonomics is, you know, the repeated stress that, that things, you know, we talk about cumulative trauma disorders and repeated stress kind of injuries and that kind of thing. And so 
what we're saying is this, we believe that this is an etiological factor in terms of the development of MSDs. As people get repeatedly stressed, you know, small little micro fractures may happen in some of their tissues over, over time. And as they continue to get repeatedly stressed, those areas, if they're not healed, will continue to grow. And eventually they'll uh, grow to, uh, to a situation where, you know, people will experience pain and disability. Right, right. And, and obviously what that also implies is that, you know, joints being areas of, let's just call them uh, areas of different anatomical tissue, obviously they're reacting to a similar force, but in different ways. Yes. So, so we've got kind of probably like six major components that are materials that, are, that make up the musculoskeletal uh, tissues in our body. And, and yes, you know, diff different ones uh, have different jobs. They're designed differently to take on different kinds of forces. And uh, so, so yes, you know, as we're, as we're going about our days, you know, we, we get, you know, kind of highly variable stressing, you know, throughout the day, typically. And, you know, each, each of these tissues is experiencing repeated stress in, in different ways, and they react a little bit differently in terms of how they, uh, how they respond to that loading. Right, right. That makes sense. Um, and sort of, you know, skipping a little bit um, with that complicated milieu, how does one then, you know, balance the need for, uh, you know, a physically demanding job with the, you know, potential health and safety concerns uh, of the workers who are performing those tasks? Because it seems to me that, you know, it isn't as straightforward as one would imagine. So. No, that's, that's a good question. And, you know, what we really are trying to do, you know, in the field of ergonomics is to, to not make that thing kind of a balance between the physical demands of the job and the safety concerns, but we're trying to, to make sure that we actually uh, reduce those stresses. You know, if we're very clever, we can, we can go into a job, kind of take a look at it and see the things that are stressing the, the worker and the individual and actually make some changes. Maybe we put in a lift table or or some other type of uh, device that will hopefully reduce the stresses that people are experiencing. So what we want to do is we want to take that, the load that people are experiencing and decrease it through being clever through our job design. And so, so you know, if we re reduce the stresses, you know, that that's kind of good for everybody and probably good for all of our musculoskeletal tissues. Right, right. So um, what I'm hearing is, and sort of just putting a layman spin to it, um, rather than lifting up boxes and sort of, you know, squatting down and trying to make sure that my form is correct, maybe I should be using a dolly or, you know, something like that. Exactly. You know, we want to use mechanical aids, you know, there's different, different kinds of ways we can do things, you know, just kind of the way the job is arranged, you know, a lot of times we can make small changes in that and that can make a fairly big difference in the uh, in the amount of stress that people are experiencing. That makes complete sense. Um, and that, that sort of leads me to, I think, two questions that I have. Um, I'd probably focus on the assessment part first, which is, I think what you're describing is, um, you know, there's obviously the ability for someone to come in, perform some sort of an assessment and say almost like a almost create a need statement or or say, you know what, uh, this is what the problem is that we have observed and potentially these are then the solutions. Um, but is it as like, uh, I'm guessing it's not only just say worksite assessment, but it's also, you know, probably talking to uh, the workers themselves, uh, the employees and sort of getting a, almost like a holistic understanding of what it is that they have to do. It, would that be a good way of, of framing uh, quote unquote assessments? Yeah, so I think it's always very uh, important to, to have workers involved with the process, you know, as you know, we like to, to kind of take a look at their jobs and, and use our tools to kind of assess, you know, what 
kind of risks we think they have. But we always want to talk to the worker uh, because in many cases, workers, you know, they have lots of good ideas. Maybe nobody's even asked them, but they may have some very good ideas about how the job might be changed to make it, you know, less stressful for them. And and so um, we like to engage workers to to tell us about their you know, their job, their ideas. You know, what are the things that really, you know, kind of really load them the highest, and uh, and get them involved in the in the changes. You know, um, that we're going to make. You know, so they're often uh, you know very you know they're the experts in their job. And a lot of times they have very good ideas in terms of how things might be rearranged to, uh, to reduce the stresses. So, right. yeah, yeah, we want to definitely take advantage of their expertise. That makes sense. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, one of the classes that I have uh, had in my uh, MBA where we were talking about healthcare operations and, and the professor was like, you know, if you really want to understand, uh, uh, you know, movement uh, within the hospital, you actually need to be talking to the people who are actually doing all the work, right? Um, so I think what you're saying makes absolute sense. Um, but could you give us, uh, would you be able to give us a specific example uh, of a tool um, perhaps that you've used and maybe what are some of the challenges for uh, implementing uh, maybe the suggestions that arose from that analysis? Well, um, so you know, I can talk a little bit about the, the tools that we've developed. Um, yeah. um, uh, we've developed kind of my colleagues and I, uh, Rich, Rich Sesek and Mark Shaw uh, from our place and some of our students have been involved with them. We've, we've actually developed three different risk assessment tools, all based on the fatigue failure theory. And and what fatigue failure theory, you know, says is that, you know, basically, uh, if you're at a pretty low level of loading, but you but you do a lot, you know, you can you can have some injuries, but but the higher the stress is, the more stress the more damage is being done uh, with each repetition that you do. And it's an exponential relationship. So, so the higher the stress is, the fewer cycles you can do before before getting damaged. And if you have a multi-task job uh, where you're doing some fairly low stress things, and then some medium stress things, and then some high stress things, our tools will kind of uh, take that into account, and we'll actually be able to tell you which part of the job is actually doing the most the most damage. And so, so you know, but but this is a this is a way of 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 kind of a assessment that, you know, one one of the things we tried to make it was pretty easy to do because you know we're trying to to make things easier for the for the people who are doing these types of assessments. But um, but again, it's something where we want to do that those assessments. Hopefully, we have some good tools that are validated, and our tools have been validated against epidemiology data. Um, but also kind of work with the, with the, uh, worker himself or herself, um, and, and kind of take those findings and talk with them and kind of, uh, talk about their perceptions of the, of the job and things that were, that may be leading them to, uh, to get some injuries. Okay. Um, so to, to create a, a, an analogy, maybe, um, and hopefully it's a, a decent analogy, um, uh, the low stress. So, for example, if I'm moving object A from, uh, you know, the table picking up lightly and then sort of just putting it maybe a few feet away from me, that would be relatively repetitive, but low stress. But if I'm having to lift boxes, um, which are slightly heavier, uh, obviously that's the medium stress and then maybe if i'm reaching overhead and lifting something up which clearly is a bad idea which we shouldn't be doing um that would probably be uh you know a, would that be a fair uh a fair analogy to make um and i think what you're suggesting is that 
um, you know, our ability to, again, lift heavy objects over our head is obviously, you know, we shouldn't be doing that at all, but that's really exacerbating perhaps some of the repetitive stress that we're facing by even doing the smaller uh, stress-related uh, work. Would that be a fair? Uh... Yeah, so so the deal with fatigue failures is, is basically it's, it's saying that e all of these things that we're doing will add to the cumulative damage that you get during the day. So the light ones, you know, if you're doing some light lifts and stuff like that, you know, it's it's going to be, it's, that's not going to add very much in terms of the cumulative damage. The the higher the the load that you're that you're lifting, you know, the more the damage is going to be for that. So so you may not even do as many with with kind of a moderate load box or a high load box, but it can be much more stressful to the body than doing a lot of the light ones. You know, really what we want to try and do is bring down that stress right. level because because people can do more the lighter the stress becomes. Right, right. That makes sense. Um, and I guess sort of, you know, moving on to the next sort of stage in that process, which is, you know, we've done the assessment um, and now we have some recommendations that we want uh, 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 the workplace with, you know, some implementation of a recommendation. Um, in your experience, um, are workplaces, uh, you know, some of these changes, are, I imagine, aren't uh, uh, easy to implement or, you know, may require a tremendous amount of capital, but how receptive are workplaces these days to making uh, the recommended changes? Well, there's, there's a whole gamut. Uh, you know, there's, um, there's some companies that are really very good about it and they, they recognize the, the need for ergonomics and, and uh, are, you know, find, trying to find ways themselves to, to, to do all the things that they need to do to, you know, uh, reduce their, their injuries. I mean, these are very expensive and they're, they're uh, you know, obviously very rough on the, on the workers. And so, so but, the, and that, then you'll find some that, you know, they don't, they don't maybe care so much about the workers. They're just, they're just thinking about the money and that kind of thing. And they're, you know, they may not be that, uh, that interested in, in making these changes, even though they could probably save a good amount of money uh, if they did so. I, I'm curious to know what, uh, uh, what the potential changes, uh, not changes, but the differences are between those two types of uh, workplaces. But I think that might be a topic for another discussion. But um, you, you mentioned something, though, which I find intriguing, which is even though it makes financial sense for the company to institute uh, the workplace to make the change, for whatever reason, they're not, you know, they're not um, motivated enough or maybe they don't have the incentives lined up correctly to make those changes. So that I think is a uh, is an interesting, um, almost uh, quixotic type of uh, uh, yeah observation, maybe. But yeah, um, yeah. one one sorry, thing I ahead. one thing I might add, you know, is that you know we find that that a lot of companies will try and do the quick fix types of types of activities, and there have been you know a lot of different strategies that people have tried over the years. Um, and a lot of these strategies, such as stretching exercises prior to work, um, use of job rotation to try and uh, even out loading, the uh, use of back belts, you know, was, was done for quite a while and everything. The, the problem is that these quick fix types of things are not very good. Uh, they've found, we found that, you know, that they're, they're, efficacy is really not not very high and so you know we need people to instead of kind of trying to do these quick fix things you know do the do the job of ergonomics and really 
kind of analyze these jobs, change the jobs to, to reduce the stresses, and then you'll get the benefit out of it. But a lot of these other types of uh, techniques that have been tried, you know, like I said, they're, they're easy to do, they're easy to implement. You know, that's why uh, the companies kind of like them and everything. But when you really do the analysis, you know, they don't do a very good job in terms of, in terms of reducing stresses, but, but ergonomic job design can. Yeah. Um, I, I, I want to generalize and say that, you know, if an employee is, a, is, is considered to be a long-term employee versus say someone who is an hourly uh, wage earner or, or a daily wage earner, my sense is that ergonomic design will be taken more seriously. Um, but uh, I, I certainly don't want to put you on the spot of making that call, but this is my just sense of it. But yeah. I don't think that's, that's far off. Um, in, in our research, um, we came across something that we thought was pretty, uh, interesting, which is, you know, the importance of considering both physical and uh, psychosocial factors in preventing work-related musculoskeletal disorders. Um, it occurs to, it occurred to us that sort of thinking about or framing, um, work-related musculoskeletal disorders through the lens of psychosocial factors is is maybe an understudied area. Uh, if, what is your sense of it? Um, and, and how can including that really create this um, integrated approach that you've described uh, in your work? Yeah, so we've got kind of a different idea about, you know, what is, what is happening with psychosocial stresses. My colleague, Mary Barb, uh, whom I wrote, wrote a book with uh, fairly recently, and I had a paper out in, in ergonomics, and it was actually judged one of the best papers in ergonomics uh, for, for last year, where we, we talked about um, some other things that psychosocial stress does. Uh, it's been largely kind of uh, assumed that psychosocial stresses um, our, our increased MSD risk because, because, um, there was increased muscle tension and so forth when people were under psychosocial stress. Now, and there may be, there is some, um, research that kind of indicates that, but, um, really when you look at the the kind of muscle tension that's increased when people are under psychosocial stress, it's not that large. And so we were looking at, at a different thing. And what we found was that when people are under psychosocial stress, uh, their healing is impacted. So one thing about fatigue failure in the, in the human body is that we can get damage but we also have a self-healing capability. Yeah. And so that self-healing capability is what allows our tissues to, to last a lifetime, basically. Um, because if we didn't, uh, the data kind of really kind of indicates that if we didn't have a healing process, you know, our tissues would not last that long. With the healing, it can, but there are certain things that impact the healing rate. And one of the things that's very clear that reduces the healing rate is psychological stress. And other things such as, you know, age as well, um, you know, being obese, um, all of these things kind of interfere with our ability to, to do that. If, if you don't get very good sleep, that's another thing that leads to that leads to problems with the, with the healing process. And so, so we kind of have this model where, you know, you're, you're building up, you're getting cumulative damage during the day, but hopefully, you know, you get some rest time and you go to sleep. Sleep happens to be very important in this. Uh, very deep sleep is where these growth factors are actually, you know, put, put out in the body that really do a lot in terms of, 
the healing uh, work that's done by the body. And if you don't get into very deep sleep, you're, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to get the benefit of that. But, but all of these things are going to kind of bring down that cumulative damage that you had during the day through the healing process. Um, but if your healing is impaired, you know, that's almost like a double whammy. You're getting increased stress, but you're not getting a very big, uh, you know, decrease due to the healing, uh, healing aspect of things. That's, uh, and you know, when, when you lay it out like that, that makes complete sense. Um, because, you know, um, I, I think what you're saying is that anything that inhibits repair and regeneration, the natural repair and regeneration that we have going on, um, obviously is going to lead to more damage. And, you know, so you've really connected those two pieces together. Uh, that, that, and it's quite brilliant as to how you've sort of uh, framed that. So that makes complete sense. Um, and obviously, uh, I think there's a growing uh, body of literature that suggests that psychosocial uh, factors have an impact on uh, reducing our normal sort of repair and regeneration. So it's only natural that it would have an impact on work-related muscular uh, skeletal uh, disorders as well. So that's um, is is that the is that the future of uh, air research in your particular area, according to you, or is there something else? that you think is, you know, uh, an area of, of, of a particular interest, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now. Um, I, I imagine that robotics are, are sort of, um, you know, um, sort of mechanical robotic type of uh, uh, aids would also be an interest. Uh, but what is what is your sort of pick for the top areas of interest moving forward within this particular field. Yeah, so I, I think that there's some some interesting things happening. Certainly, uh, what we've just talked about in terms of the, the healing and cumulative damage, I think is a an area that is ripe for a lot of research. Um, and really, we don't understand, we don't understand nearly well enough the relationship between the damage accumulation that's occurring in the body and how that interacts kind of with the healing, the healing. But, you know, um, I think we can kind of understand that if we have a high amount of a stress that we're getting during the, during the day, and we don't have a very good healing amount, you know, that's going to be kind of a double whammy, you know, so you're, yeah. you're going to, you're going to be, um, you're going to be getting into trouble there. Now, other things, yeah, certainly in terms of reducing stress, robotics and and uh, and those sorts of things, you know, uh, certainly have a place in in reducing uh, these injuries. Um, the exoskeletons are are also kind of a kind of an interesting thing. They're they're kind of the rage, and I I think that you know, really if they're if they're done correctly. Um, they can be a big help, but, uh, but there's still a lot that, that people have to, to learn to deal with, with, with the exoskeletons. Um, one thing is that the exoskeletons almost inevitably do not move the same way that the human yeah. moves. Yeah. And so, so the, the idea of, you know, the fit of the, of the exoskeleton is, is very important, you know, cause it can, can lead to, um, uh, actually more problems if 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 you don't have a have a good fitting you know exoskeleton but but certainly they've got i think there there's certainly places where exoskeletons you know probably can and should be used um but uh yeah so so i think that those are some of the things that that kind of come in in the future that you know we need to understand physiologically what's going on, but also take advantage of, of some of the, the, you know, devices that we have and employ them in the correct places. And, uh, you, know, you know, through all of these things, I think we can, we can make a difference in terms of, of the incidence of these disorders. Building on that, um, you know, 
personally, what uh, what excites you uh, about this uh, about the field? Um, you know, it, it, it's I I I like to uh, we like to ask our guests uh, this particular question because um, you know. Uh, there's a particular reason you got into this field. You're obviously, uh, you know, an expert in it. Um, uh, what excites you about this field, um, you know, personally? Uh, what is it that you would tell a medical student who's coming in, is, is coming up to you and says, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Gallagher, I'm interested in, in pursuing this particular field. What, what, what advice would you give them uh, if, if they were to approach you? Yeah, well, I, I just have to say, you know, with the things that we've been talking about already, you know, that there's, it's a, it's a great time actually to be entering this field. And I think that there are going to be countless opportunities to make important scientific contributions as we continue to understand our complex and dynamic, you know, multi, uh, musculoskeletal system, you know, how we can understand the risk, you know, improve our ability to to uh, understand the risk that people are under and how we can reduce that and uh, find better ways of prevention and, and therapeutic measures for people when they do get hurt. So you know, to me, the, the body is a it's a wonderful, fascinating uh, organism and it's never going to continue it'll always continue to surprise us. But certainly, you know, I think it's very gratifying to work in a field whose goal is to prevent pain and disability uh, and uh, hopefully leading to happier, healthier lives for our fellow human beings. That's, yeah. Um, the, when, when, you, when you mentioned that the that the human body is is uh, fascinating. It's it's one of the, I think, by the end of my first year. And so I actually went to med school. Uh, uh, I I'm not a practicing physician, but um, I would say that I'm still abreast of a lot of the literature that at least is coming out. But you know, that was the like after first year anatomy, I was just my and physiology. My brain just went. It was just like, this is, you know, it's incredible. Um, uh, so I, I agree with you completely. Um, you know, the human body is fascinating. Um, we continue to learn more and more about it. Um, and uh, to your point about, you know, the time being right, uh, I think we've, we've got to a place where, you know, our computational models are are doing really well. Our ability to collect you know, certain types of granular information and devices and, uh, you know, those things we've, we're, we're sort of at this zone where we can bring a lot of, um, interesting insights to bear on a particular problem. And I certainly do agree with you that, you know, when it comes to ergonomics, uh, biomechanics, um, musculoskeletal, uh, work-related disorders, certainly there is, um, just anecdotally, it seems to be like there's a growing uh, body of evidence that's sort of like this wave that's pushing uh, our research forward. So I think that's that's very interesting to know. I just I uh, just like to add, you know, a little bit, you know, that our, our fatigue failure model, you know, this is something that we have haven't had in the field before. And that that is, you know, uh, an ideological you know, understanding of like what's going on. And, you know, I think fatigue failure kind of helps us. Obviously it's a, it's fatigue failure, kind of like metals and stuff like that, but not quite the same because we've got the healing process, you know, metals can't heal themselves and stuff like that. So, but, but it gives us a plausible mechanism as to how these things are, are developing. And through that knowledge, I think we can come up with better ways of, of both risk assessment and uh, of you know, changing jobs so that we can make sure that people aren't, aren't getting overstressed in, in doing that. As you described it, it seems very obvious to me, but uh, I guess a question for you, how, how pervasive 
uh, do you think this uh, idea or this how how well accepted is this model given that you know it is uh, in your own words uh, a model that net wasn't existing earlier necessarily yeah i i think that you know the the understanding i i think a lot of people in the field are are very positive about this and so so i think that 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 things are going well. I mean, I think it makes sense. And there's also a lot of evidence behind it. And, you know, one of the things that I think is the clearest evidence, you know, well, first of all, you know, if we test these tissues, musculoskeletal tissues in a laboratory, a cadaver tissues, for example, they fail by means of a fatigue failure process. I mean, that, that they, they all do each, yeah. each material shows that it that it experiences you know fatigue fair like this um so we've got that we've got our tools that that seem to also relate to epidemiology evidence you know when our tools say hey if you've had this many repetitions at this level of loading and we give you kind of a risk we find when we you know apply it to epidemiology studies we find that there's a very good correspondence to that and the, the other thing, you know, there's other evidence such as we can actually see it in animal models. Hmm. You know, when, when you uh, repeatedly stress an animal model, there have been some good, some good studies on, on rats and uh, mice and, and this kind of thing. And you can see the damage, you know, as, as, it, as it starts to develop. And uh, so, you know, we can actually see this happening and so, you know, I think it's kind of hard, you know, certainly that that seems like it's pretty, uh, pretty sound um, evidence to me. And, uh, you know, so so everything so far, I think, has been been working well. And the fact that our risk assessment tools based on fatigue failure methods all seem to work very well, um, you know, I, I think that. I think we're on the right path. So uh, what you described, uh, let, let's just call that, say, uh, retrospective data. But uh, it's could you uh, perhaps uh, describe if there's any prospective data as well that supports uh, this particular model? Um, I, I so that's that's a difficult question to to uh, to deal with. Because we have had, we have looked at some prospective studies and we've done some analyses. Okay. And that there's a, we do find a significant relationship there. Okay. So I think that the, the point that I was trying to, to make, at least for the audience, was, you know, there's, there's different types of data, but, you know, there is, once when once we start talking about prospective data, then obviously the that you know the scientific uh, validity of that model just becomes stronger, I guess. So yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I believe you're giving a workshop uh, at the uh, conference. Uh, what can what can our listeners, uh, prospective uh, conference attendees, look forward to in that workshop? You know, well, we're going to be. Um talking about a number of different things, but, you know, we're going to be focusing on the fatigue failure model, kind of what it means, how it, how, how it came about it, you know, give them a little history of fatigue failure. You know, it's, it's actually been around for like, uh, you know, 150 years or so. Um, it was when it was this, you know, mechanism was first uh, dealt with in, in, you know, train accidents and things like that is where it was kind of first really realized what was happening. Um, but we're going to be talking about it in, in what it means in terms of musculoskeletal disorders. We'll be uh, providing people with with the tools and so forth. We're going to do uh, kind of a deep dive on musculoskeletal uh, uh, st structures and, and uh, and this kind of thing, you know, Mary kind of Mary Barb, who we're going to be doing the uh, workshop with, you know, she's she un understands all the biological 
uh, issues and, and kind of how things kind of work together in the body. I'm kind of the more, you know, uh, biomechanical, you know, uh, kind of thing, looking at the larger kind of stresses that are on the body and this, this and that. But, uh, but, but we will have a very comprehensive, we're going to do it over, over eight hours. And, and uh, I think in that time, we'll be able to give a pretty comprehensive understanding to people uh, as to what this all means in terms of, you know, musculoskeletal disorders and ways that we can improve jobs, you know, get better risk assessments and so forth uh, in, in, our, in our daily work as er ergonomists. Um, Dr. Gallagher, I believe you're also giving a keynote uh, uh, a lecture. Uh, would you be able to describe to the audience uh, what they can expect? Uh, uh, what is it that they should be looking forward to? Yeah, so, so we are going to be, you know, looking at kind of that balance between cumulative damage buildup in musculoskeletal tissues and healing properties. Um, but also, we'll also be kind of talking a little bit about in there, you know, uh, the issue of, you know, the di diversity of human beings and how, you know, these, the same stress that's experienced by different human beings is going to be, can be quite different. And, you know, it depends on whether you're, you're uh, old or young, you know, uh, have large anthropometry or, or small anthropometry, you know, it changes the, the strength with which you're going to be able to, uh, to have, uh, to withstand this stress. And so, um, and we'll talk about kind of the dynamics of it. And, you know, a, a lot of that's going to be dealing with, with the healing process that, that we've uh, talked about before. We think that this is a kind of an important addition, you know, it's like the physical stresses are, are, are important, but, but, uh, I think we shouldn't, you know, drop the ball in terms of, in terms of understanding, you know, what kind of factors, you know, may impair healing and which may increase the likelihood of injury. So I think what you just sort of set up is almost like, uh, if we were to call them loosely speaking determinants, then we have, you know, resilience within the individual or the population, um, the exposure to um, the stress or in this particular uh, uh, example, uh, exposure to say a work-related stress. Um, and then obviously the quality of, you know, the rest and recuperation or the repair and regeneration uh, mechanisms that we have. So I think uh, uh, linking those three understanding the interplay between those three, I think is, is what you're describing. Would that be fair? That's what we're going to try and attack. Yes. Okay. That, um, that sounds uh, particularly fascinating and hopefully uh, I'll be able to attend that talk as well, because this is, this is a personal interest of mine. So, uh, Dr. Gallagher, thank you for your time. Uh, this has been a pleasure. Mm -hmm.